Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. To improve your skills in science, maths, and computer science, go to the link in the description. So COP26 happened, and COP26 was an historic success. For the first time ever at a COP, coal was specifically called out, and Article 6 of the Paris Agreement on Emissions Trading was finally approved. The science was taken seriously, and alongside an impressive pledge on deforestation, we saw far more ambitious pledges on carbon emissions than we've ever seen at a COP before. COP26 was a failure. The conference was exclusionary, it failed to deliver to marginalised communities, the language of the final agreement was watered down at the last moment, and nowhere near enough progress was made on climate finance to support the global south and renewable energy infrastructure. The conference was a whole lot of talk and no action. Like many people, I've spent the last several weeks trying to unpick my feelings about the conference and have read dozens and dozens of articles and opinion pieces, all with different conclusions. And to be honest, I still don't know how I really feel about it. For what it's worth, I think the best, most objective analysis has come from Carbon Brief. This absolutely isn't sponsored by them, but if you want to stay on top of developments in climate science at any time, not just in COP, then that's how I do it. I have my opinion of COP26, which we'll get to in a little bit, but that's not what this video is about. I'm not going to be able to magically tease apart the hot take spaghetti and form a cohesive thesis statement, for reasons that we'll also get to in a bit. Reading these opinion pieces, the conclusion I've ultimately come to is that what you take away from COP26 depends on the lens through which you view progress on climate change. Because a lot of the positive takes on COP26 have come from policymakers and some scientists and particularly I think journalists, and I think that's because they are judging COP26 as, well, a COP. What's the purpose of a COP? Well, it stands for Conference of Parties, and it's the highest level meeting of governments as part of the UNFCCC, agreeing on a strategy to combat climate change in a global framework. The point of COP26, then, was to check in on progress, evolve the international context of domestic climate policy, and generally raise media hoo-ha around climate change. And when viewed in this way, through the existing power structures of climate action, COP26 was a huge success. It did everything it was supposed to do. Those who have focused on the negatives of COP26 have largely been activists and some scientists. And I think these parties are viewing climate change through the lens of both opportunity and action. These people want to limit the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and prevent warming, but at the same time view this as an opportunity to remake the world in a more fair way, in a more just way. Hence the frustration at the language being watered down, the failure to support those in the global south developing sustainably, and it being a lot of words and no action. Both of these views are logical, considering the lens that they are looking at the conference through. I should point out, of course, that this isn't some clever new idea that I've come up with. Whenever anyone looks at anything in the world and forms an opinion, that opinion will depend on the lens that they are looking at that thing through. Looking at this free shivokadi, for example, do you see a foodstuff or a way of making a living? A carbon footprint or the reason that I still don't own a house? The crucial thing about the climate crisis is that it affects everyone. There are literally no bystanders. And so there are a vast number of ways that we can frame the climate crisis and the actions we take to try and fix it. It's basically individual. Policymakers look at it through the lens of existing governmental powers. Those in the global south look at it as an existential threat and emblematic of the unjust nature of global economics. And those in the right wing press look at it through the lens of ridicule. Now, I'm a physicist by training, so my take is through the lens of how the physical system of the atmosphere will respond to the actions of this conference. Though I should probably also say that as a Brit, I think it was a shambles for a variety of reasons. As a physicist, COP26 made progress. It will reduce the total amount of CO2 we emit into the atmosphere, and so the total warming we'll eventually experience. But the pledges made at the conference were not radical enough to avoid warming that modelling indicates will likely be very harmful. Based on the pledges made at the conference, we're not going to avoid limiting warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial. We'd be lucky to limit it to two degrees above pre-industrial. What could they have done to more aggressively limit emissions? There's a laundry list of things I'd have liked to have seen, but didn't. A moratorium on new coal plants by 2030, more extensive climate finance for the global south to support renewable energy infrastructure, an accountability mechanism for national emissions, and so on. This is obviously mostly aligned with the reaction of climate activists. 
which isn't a surprise because I identify as one. But I have to temper that reaction because I'm making this video. I think what struck me the most is how media, both professional and social, have talked about COP26. Because almost irrespective of the lens you're looking through, we all want the same outcome, to keep the global climate as close to what it's been in the near past as possible. And in order to accomplish that goal, we require coordinated, cooperative action on a scale that the world has never seen before. Crucially, that action needs to come from across society and over several decades. We'll only accomplish that goal if the majority of people are on board with reducing greenhouse gas emissions and stay on board for decades. And so how the majority of people perceive the climate crisis is crucial. The need to understand that the situation is bad, but fixable. If you're an editor at BBC News or a reporter at the conference, the question of was COP26 a success or not really becomes the question, how do we talk about progress in the context of the climate crisis? Because yes, the conference was progress, but I think people would argue that it went the opposite direction. A lot of people would argue, including myself however, that while it was progress, it wasn't enough progress. At the same time though, any reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is good. The IPCC was very clear about this in their most recent report. The climate isn't a discrete system with step changes at one and a half and two degrees of warming, but a continuum of outcomes. Any reduction in emissions will result in a reduction in total warming, and so success. So COP26 was a success, it reduced future warming, but also a failure. It didn't reduce that warming by enough. And how, as somebody making a video for example, do you cover that without being too optimistic or too pessimistic? Too optimistic and your audience comes away with the impression that the trajectory we're on is sufficient to avoid catastrophic warming, which it isn't. Too pessimistic on the other hand and your audience comes away with the impression that we tried our best and it still wasn't enough. So. What's the point in trying? The situation's hopeless. Media will play a crucial role this century in determining how we respond to the climate crisis, and how urgent and how actionable we think the situation is. The quality of reporting and the lens that it chooses to view the problem through will largely determine our response to it. And I am desperately aware that I need to thread the needle of urgency and optimism. And some journalists have erred on one side, either deliberately or because of their worldview, and others have erred on the other side. But the crucial thing is to ensure that my, our, audience remains engaged in the problem even when our current best attempt at a solution isn't enough. And this is now my opinion, this is like my personal operating rulebook when talking about this stuff. In that opinion, in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions enough to avoid two degrees Celsius of warming, let alone one and a half degrees Celsius of warming, the conversation around the climate crisis needs to stress that it's not too late, and in fact it's never too late to improve the situation. That the climate crisis is not a personal responsibility. Individual actions will play a part, but existing power structures got us into this mess and currently look incapable of getting us out of it. We need to reassess the systems of international finance, environmental accountability and inclusivity if we want to fix this problem. That the impacts are global and uneven, and we need to have compassion for and take action to help those who are in the front lines of the changing climate. That there doesn't need to be a trade-off between development and sustainability, if we acknowledge that we're all in this together. And lastly, that the situation is urgent. The sooner we fix this problem, the better, and the fewer destabilizing influences on global society we will have to endure. With this in mind, people who have been celebrating the successes of the conference need to ask themselves if the existing structure of COPs is really sufficient to the task at hand. Perhaps we should be looking at new ways to find a solution to the climate crisis. Look outside the box. While people who have decried the conference's failures are, in my view, correct for doing so, they need to be careful that public perception of the climate crisis doesn't slide into hopelessness or exhaustion at the same message over and over again. We should be emphasising that any reduction in emissions means a reduction in future warming, which is good, but at the same time providing a list of actions that we should be demanding of our governments to enable more radical change. Finally, however, the reason I didn't want this video to be about my take on COP26 is because there is no one right take on COP26. 
because we are a multitude creating and experiencing the effects of climate change, it's important to have that represented in our response to it, in response to our solutions to it. A diversity of voices in this conversation is fundamental to us addressing the problem in a fair, inclusive way. Because there are multiple completely valid ways to view it, and we can learn a lot about how we are grappling with this issue by listening to each other. But the fundamental is the physical system, and how we are forcing it with our emissions. And on that front, COP26 was good, but it could have been a lot better. And there's no time to waste. So now, post-conference, let's strive towards that better. Keep going and build on what was achieved in Glasgow. This video is a convolution of two ideas, media literacy and scientific literacy. Being aware of the worldview of the author is crucial for the former, but the latter can only really be obtained by doing science yourself. That doesn't have to be doing research though. It could be learning about a new topic and putting your understanding to the test by answering questions. Apply your knowledge, and if you get something wrong, then you learn from the experience. You're better equipped for next time. This is how scientists train, and it's how Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video, also works. Brilliant is an educational website and app that has dozens of expertly written interactive courses in maths, science and computer science. Develop your critical thinking skills with their course on logic, or your understanding of solar power with their courses on solar thermal and solar PV. They're constantly adding new courses and refreshing old ones, making them more interactive, all based on the concept of learning by doing, not just memorising facts and regurgitating them for a test. This makes Brilliant an ideal companion to classroom learning, and a great way for those of us now out of education to engage with new subjects in a meaningful way and keep our minds sharp. If you'd like to try out Brilliant for free and get 20% off a year of STEM learning for yourself or for a student in your life, click the link in the description down below or visit brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. This video was so hard to write, and I'm still not happy with it, but I, at the end of the day, just had to get this done and out there. COP26 was frustrating as all hell to try and follow and keep up with and pick apart, and I hope that this video has not added to the hot take spaghetti, but instead provided a little bit of meta context. I really hope that you liked the video. If you did, please do pop it a like and share it with people that you think might also be interested. If you'd like to see some more stuff from me, then there's some recommended viewing up here. And that just leaves me to say thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.